Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. Tonight, I'd like to take you back to the forests of Pennsylvania to continue another account of encounters with my least favorite pasta creatures. Not because of bad stories, you understand. No, I, I rather like these stories, or I wouldn't narrate them here. I mean least favorite, because body horror and spiders just squick me right the hell out. On then, to our abominable anecdote for the evening. Return to Pennsylvania, parts 1 and 2, by Rinskaro 13. It's been exactly three years since I last saw my girlfriend Anne, with the last time being at the airport in Pennsylvania. I'd lived in PA for most of my childhood, but I decided to pursue my studies abroad, first in California, then in the UK. Returning to Pennsylvania was by no means an easy journey. Taking study leave was a piece of cake. Um, however, my part-time job wasn't enough to fund my ticket fares, so I'd had to work night shifts and extra hours to be able to save up for that single excursion. Moreover, I needed to see Anne desperately. I was afraid that our relationship would degenerate if I didn't play my part. See, to me, Anne was the most beautiful girl in the world. We'd known each other since elementary school, and we'd never lost contact until January, the year before last. She'd said that a close friend had gone missing in December after a camping trip, and that the authorities were unable to trace her body, leaving my girlfriend shattered. From then on, her emails were brief and sharp, and we gradually stopped calling or messaging each other altogether. I'd tried to contact her on her birthday, but even then my efforts were still futile. Though I understand why she was upset, she'd never bothered to discuss the incident with me, nor did she rely on me as a source of comfort. It was as if she'd thrown me out of her life. Following this temporary mess in our relationship, I soon considered that maybe I was the one to blame. I'd been selfish and only worried about our connection, knowing little to nothing about the incident that she kept referring to. I searched for news on Pennsylvania Online and realized that I'd been much more behind than I thought I was. Two whole years behind, in fact. Since my mother, the only remaining member of my family left alive, had died just days after I went abroad, I had no close relatives to keep in touch with. However, still, it was hard to believe that I had missed such an incident occurring in my own hometown. The online articles described the disappearance of a group of teenage campers in December of 1998. These teenagers were out on an expedition to the outskirts of Pennsylvania in a remote area next to a forest dangerously close to mine and Anna's hometown. As I scrolled further down the page, I felt a bead of sweat crawl down my face on suddenly recognizing some of the names listed on the missing section. Ronald Savage, Becky Westfield, Thomas Packard, these were people that I had known, even spoken to before. With us being around the same age, I had been companions to many of them in middle school. Even after half an hour of gazing at the names intently, I still found it hard to believe that they were gone. Thinking of their confused, weeping parents as they sat in front of their televisions, swallowing the news of the devastation, knowing that their beloved children would never return home, part of me wanted to simply collapse onto the floor and never get up again. However, the most disturbing part of all of this was reading the transcripts of the excerpts from the diary written by one of the girls on the journey, published with the article. In the entries, she described her daily events followed by a sudden onslaught of terrifying experiences in which she documents the details of creatures that she called spider cannibals lurking in the woods right up until her unfortunate death. Her last words chilled me to the bone as I imagined myself in her place, so desperately trying to crawl away from my inevitable fate. I considered these creatures, which she 
as I had said, labeled spider cannibals in one of her entries. I noticed the term was fairly inaccurate, as it implied the creature was a spider which ate its own species, when in fact it was something completely different. Whatever it was, I instinctively found myself concerned for Anne's safety, even though it had been two years since these things were first spotted, and they haven't been seen since. It was creepy, even frightening, to think that all the evidence which should have been at the scene, like bodies and such, were nowhere to be found. After a whole year of roaming around looking for clues, police have declared the area safe, even though they couldn't salvage any useful clues from within that time period. The ongoing investigation continued. However, the citizens became much more relaxed and lighthearted about the situation, as time smoothed out the effects of the shock. Another point which came across to my mind while surfing online was that this had become an extremely controversial and heated topic. If any user on any forum posted a slightly negative comment on the issue, they'd be banned immediately and frowned upon by the rest of the community. People often didn't realize when they were crossing the line in this discussion and were punished with sanctions when they did so, and in the end, most users simply stopped discussing the topic in fear of offending others. Of course, I felt an amount of sympathy for the families and the loved ones affected. A great amount. However, the level of unnecessary fuss was, well, quite unnecessary. Most people couldn't even ask what had happened without getting labeled as a sick fuck with no concern for the feelings of others. Wondering how Anne was coping with the stress back in Pennsylvania, I phoned her in October to discuss the matter. Miraculously, she answered the phone and invited me to her new apartment in the city. We had a deeply emotional conversation about how we missed each other and how apologetic we were, but I was simply relieved that I could hear her voice again. After purchasing my tickets last month, I was finally able to return home. I boarded the flight in the morning, full of anticipation, expecting the slowest plane journey of my life. Arriving at Philly International, I switched on my phone, only to be greeted with a set of phone calls from an unknown number. I soon discovered that Anne had changed her number and her address. She told me that she'd be picking me up from the local cab station in front of the airport. The feelings of utter joy that I experienced were hard to describe. I was going to see my girlfriend again after all this time we'd lost. I was going to see my girlfriend again after all this time. And after all the time we'd lost, and my expectations were really far from low. Half an hour later, Anne appeared behind me and I was greeted with a cheerful, Hello! Expecting to see the face that I'd been so used to seeing before I left. I was surprised to turn around and feel a sudden but gentle kiss upon my lips. It was a familiar feeling which I adjusted to after a few seconds, and soon we were both engaged in a passionate kiss. After we broke contact, I noticed Anne's eyes. The sea blue color contrasted well with her bright blonde hair, and I touched it gently, watching it flow along with the breeze. Not a thing had changed in her since I last saw her. She was still the most beautiful girl in the world. We both decided it would be a suitable idea to take a cab all the way home, even if it took a few hours, as the buses were slow due to the excessive amount of snow lining the roads. As we closed the doors, the immediate warm, soothing effect neutralized the bitter cold we were previously subject to. After some time, we found ourselves talking about things that we'd ignored throughout our lives, like the colors of houses. We told each other jokes, and Anne rambled on about her new job and her apartment, and all the while, I pretended to listen in. Uh, however, there was something which didn't seem right about the conversation. I had the distinct feeling that she was trying to avoid the subject. She would interrupt me during sentences, probably because she suspected that I would mention something about it. Then she would stutter, being tongue-tied 
afterwards. Genuinely sympathizing with her, I wanted to put an end to all this. I just wanted to tell her to tell me not just why she had been so upset, but why she refused to talk about the issue, especially with me. She tried to brush it off with jokes or denial at first, but after asking a few more times, she simply replied, I don't care. This confused me as I knew that she was fully aware of the situation. Why not? I asked. I heard some campers went missing around your area a few years ago. Was the friend you were talking about related to that? And ignored my question and looked out the window. The green field that passed the cab was a familiar sight. I tried to remember where I'd seen the place before. Had I dreamt it somewhere? No. It was definitely the picture that I saw online of the campsite in which the 98 disappearances occurred. For no apparent reason, I found myself sweating and I felt my heartbeat began to accelerate. Was that really the place? I couldn't believe it, but it seemed so alike. Anne unfastened her seatbelt. Before I could ask what she was trying to do, she turned to the driver and demanded that we stop right where we were and walk home, leaving him with, well, lots of extra cash. We only have about an hour left, she told me. We might as well go for a romantic stroll, if that's okay with you. Suddenly bewildered, I nevertheless agreed and stepped out of the cab onto the pavement, walking around the boot to open my door and give my girlfriend a hand. She ignored it and stood up out of the cab on her own, leaving me standing stationary, kind of ashamed. Each step that she took made a soul-slapping dent in the snow, which had built up quite a lot since we'd left the airport. Where would you like to go? I asked. Are you familiar with this area? I felt a warm aura surround her as I saw her glistening smile. Yes, I know this area pretty well. Um, anything wrong? No. She took my hand and we walked towards the green plain, now covered in white chunks of snow. Was this a different place to the one that I'd imagined? And seemed to be quite comfortable around the area, which was unusual for someone whose friend had disappeared there before. Maybe I'd mistaken it for somewhere else, or maybe it simply looked similar in the snow. It was approaching nine in the afternoon. The grassy area lay underneath an orange sea as the sun appeared to slowly sink into the trees, making the trees appear ominous and shadowy. But even though I doubted myself, my instincts told me to be wary of my surroundings. Anne was walking beside me, holding my hand. However, it brought me no comfort. In fact, it actually aroused an awkward sense of suspicion. Hey, Anne? Yes? Is this the place where those campers disappeared a few years ago? You know, the place you always... Campers disappeared, she replied. Don't think I heard of that. I paused for a second. Something seemed very wrong, and this time I was able to directly put my finger on what it was, and had definitely known what I was trying to talk about. She had called me before we had lost touch, crying about her friend who happened to be one of the missing victims. Furthermore, she couldn't have forgotten that after just two years. Not that. Was she trying to avoid the subject again? Was she trying to avoid the subject again? Most likely, but... This time, I wasn't going to let it slip. We continually ventured on, hand in hand, further down the plain. The road seemed more distant now, and the sound of the cars softened as they disappeared behind the mountains. Sensing a tight atmosphere between us, I kept quiet for about ten minutes, simply pretending to notice the beautiful scenery around us. Uh, however, the sun had set, and the darkness was beginning to unnerve me. I could already see the edge of the moon begin to emerge, and I knew that it was past nine already. And you know what I'm talking about. You even called me to tell me about your friend. You even called me to tell me about your friend who you said had been a victim. 
Don't scare me, Jacob. What are you getting at? I'm not trying to scare you. I, it's just... Are you trying to joke around? This is serious. How can you simply acknowledge a friend had been missing, cry about it for a while, and then deny that you ever knew about her? Is that even humane? I don't... Now, I know you don't want to go into the subject again, but you can at least let me understand why you're upset. I sighed. Furthermore, you never told me fully... Furthermore, you never even fully told me what had happened. I had to go and research it for myself after you scared me half to death and broke connection with me for seemingly no reason at all. We've known each other all our lives, and this is how much you trust me? Aren't we friends? Aren't we willing to share our feelings with each other? And then when something like this happens, you completely shut me out. Have I ever done anything to betray you? was quiet. She didn't answer as we kept walking deeper and deeper into the forest. It was at that moment that I noticed we weren't walking towards the city like we should have been, but we were walking in the opposite direction, right into the deepest part of the forest. Hey, where are you going? I cried. Even I know the city isn't this way. We're com we're going completely the opposite direction. What's up with you? She was still silent, as I expected. Then I looked down at her. Her blonde hair looked somehow much messier than before. The moonlight shone on her fur coat, which was ripped and torn everywhere, almost like rags. How come I hadn't noticed that before? She didn't look half as beautiful now as when I first saw her a few hours ago. As my gaze moved down toward her gloves, I spotted a thin red mark below her wrist. A cut? I pushed her sleeve up her arm, but she didn't seem to respond. Concealed beneath the fabric were several lines of scars, some deeper than the others. I took off my gloves to feel the texture of her arm, and the patch of skin around the marks was cracked and sensitive. My feelings of anxiety turned to dread and shock. She'd been cutting her wrists. What's wrong? She asked. You aren't as talkative as before. Cat got your tongue? I jumped. Her voice made my blood run cold. All the warmth had been sucked out of the previously elegant sound, and now it was as cold as the snow surrounding us. I don't blame you for my misery, but... I'm afraid you're simply unlucky to be caught up in all this. If it weren't for me, you'd be enjoying a content little life somewhere else, not having to suffer your fate. A hint of smile appeared on her face. It both confused me and terrified me at the same time. Her words made no sense, yet she seemed to be so sure of what she was saying. What do you mean, my fate? Snap out of it, for goodness sake. Just tell me what's going on and I'll try and help any way I can. You don't have to be nervous. Even though I directed it towards her, I knew I was being hypocritical. I was quite sure that I was the only one nervous. Sorry, but it's too late. I had known her since childhood. She's gone, and you can't bring her back. Anyway, what could you do to help me, Jake? If I tell you, you can only feel sorry for me and then forget about it later. To tell you the truth, you're nothing more than a stranger to me. But I only stick by you, because I don't want to hurt your feelings. My only friends died here, and my family doesn't care about me anymore. We've known each other for years. I know your family cares about you. How could you say that? I don't care about anything, she smirked. Before I could reply, I heard the sound of metal scraping 
and I suddenly saw my own reflection staring back at me. To my horror, the look on my face was one of complete shock, and then I noticed that Anne was holding a large kitchen knife in front of my face with the blade angled towards my neck. A bead of sweat slowly trickled down the side of my face as I gulped, staring into my own eyes. Did you know, Jacob, you were right all along? The light, almost psychotic chuckle made a shiver run down my spine. I'd never heard a human being laugh like that before, and it certainly shocked me. This is the same area where the disappearances took place. You were right. And I'm going to finish you here, too, just like the rest of them. What? Suddenly, I understood. Message received, loud and clear. She was going to kill me. We were in the midst of the forest, deep in the woods. She had coaxed me into it. If I died here, my body wouldn't be found for months, even years. Also, how had Anne created that knife out of thin air? She must have had it with her all along, or brought it somewhere from the airport. I froze in terror. Th this was cruel. This was premeditated murder. I still didn't understand what was going on. However, all I could do was fight back. Since she was of a smaller stature than I was, there was a good chance that I could defend myself without hurting her, if I tried. I still couldn't think of any reason why she would want to do something like this. However, if my girlfriend did try to kill me, whatever happens afterwards really isn't my problem. I tried to defend myself, but my body didn't seem to be responding. I couldn't understand what was going on until I looked down to see my blood. My very own blood dripping down my trousers and staining my clothes. And suddenly I felt an intense pain in my neck. I screamed, but I, I couldn't make a sound. Falling to my knees, I clutched at the open wound and felt the palms of my hands met with a constant flow of crimson liquid. And bent down and grabbed my hair, preparing to finish me off. And finally, I realized this wasn't the Anne I knew before. Her tragic experiences had made of her an insane monster. Finally, I realized that the scars that she'd gotten from the death of her friends were too much for her to bear and they had sucked the soul out of her. The psychotic sparkle in her eyes was the clear mark of a madman. The real Anne was long gone. Two years gone. I saw through the move and lunged sideways, narrowly avoiding her attack. The knife lodged into the tree next to me and she struggled to pull it out. The pain of the cut was tearing into my neck. However, I made an effort to ignore it as I crawled, slowly making my way off the floor. Anne walked after me, knowing that I would soon be dead meat. And still, I moved as fast as I could, choking on my own blood. Ah, young love. Beautiful, isn't it? If you want to know what happens in our little lover's tiff, you'll need to listen in next time for our <laughs> cutting conclusion. Stay scary, my wildlings. Never have a long-distance relationship with crazy, and make the most of your nights. <laughs>